straight back down. Our flights last on average about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, the science that we do is for uh, researchers across the country. What they do is they submit proposals to NASA, they get peer reviewed and selected, and those requirements are sent down to us. Uh, typically they have an instrument that they want to fly, and we take their instruments, integrate it into one of our uh, standard payloads with whatever modules that they need to accomplish their mission, and we launch it for them. Our typical missions last anywhere from six months to two years, depends on how fast they want to go and what type of mission it is. Um, and our mission costs are, um, we're a high, uh, high speed, low, uh, low cost access to space. So our mission costs, you know, range anywhere between like one to five million dollars. Whereas you get on a satellite, it's tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, we can fly 200 to 1,200 pound payloads to altitudes. This one's going to be a metric, anywhere between 100 kilometers to 1,200 kilometers. So a reference there, space station orbits at about 400 kilometers. So although we can fly four times higher than the space station. Again, we're just going straight up and coming right back down. Any questions so far? How many G's does it pull? Some of them can go up to 20 G's. So, uh, not man rated. Not man rated, <laughs> no. no. What, what's a typical uh, weightless time, uh, microgravity time? Uh, kind of on the order of two to five minutes, depending on what size launch vehicle we use. Uh, speaking of our launch vehicles, a lot of what we use is military surplus rocket motors. So they're old Army, Navy motors that uh, have either aged out or they no longer want to use. So we happily take those for free. Uh, we stack them up in all different kinds of shapes and configurations. And we're able to launch uh, all different types of payloads to all different altitudes. We kind of fill a unique gap where aircraft are way down here in the atmosphere, satellites are way up here. We can kind of hit right in the middle and accomplish all kinds of science that you can only do on a, on a sounding rocket. Can you give us an example of, a, of science that you complete in the Sure, there are kind of three main types that we do. Uh, we do solar research where, say, uh, people that study the sun have a telescope that they want to use to look at the sun, to look at solar spots, all kinds of things I don't know about. Uh, another type we do is planetary science, where again, it'll be more of a telescope on board, and they'll get up into space and orient uh, towards a planetary body in deep space that they can see better. Um, and then the third type we do is like plasma physics and auroral research, where we'll actually go up to Alaska, and we can sit there at T minus 10 minutes, um, as soon as the science conditions are right, we can put our payload exactly into the aurora, right where we want it to be, uh, on the command of the scientists when the science conditions look right. So those are kind of the three main types of science that we do. Uh, we do some other things here or there for reimbursable customers. Uh, we just did a, a re-entry test for Langley. They have an aeroshell which inflates and re-enters, and they're studying that for, I believe it's Mars re-entry. And so we just launched that for them. But our primary core science is solar, planetary, the plasma physics. Are your sounding rockets staged or are they just one shot and they just go? They're staged. We fly anywhere between single to four stage vehicles. Mm -hmm. Do you always recover the payload or do you have to transmit like wow. from the air? Um, we almost all flights do transmit the data back down to the ground. Okay. Uh, but we do recover probably around half of our missions. And uh, we do both land and water recovery. We launch, uh, one of our primary launch sites is out of New Mexico, White Sands, New Mexico, if you're familiar with that. Um, and they land in the desert, we fly out with the helicopter, pick it up, and uh, a lot of times with the telescopes, they'll just refurbish them and fly them again. So uh, that's the way we can even be cheaper, is we can fly the same payload three, three four times and uh, get even more science out of it. Uh, which is the lowest part here, uh, 
that's the Terrier rocket motor. That was the Navy motor. The second page with the yellow fins and the white cylinder is the Orion motor. That was an old Army surplus motor. And then the silver thing at the top is what we call a payload. Uh, the payload is actually what we build, fabricate, and test in this facility. Our rocket motors are all stored across the runway, uh, and we test those over there. We keep them away from the people in this building. Ship everything new together, everything to the field. We put it all together and we launch it. Uh, this is another one of our um, example sounding rocket motors. Uh, this is the Black Grant vehicle. Um, this is actually one of two motors that we purchased commercially. It's made by a vendor in Canada, uh, Bristol Aerospace. Um, and uh, it has a little bit more higher performance, and there's no currently no military surplus motor that can have the performance of this motor, so we have to buy this one. Uh, and again, this is, I'm sorry, this is on this one, um, this is just a, a blank skin. Yeah, there's, there's uh, nothing in there. This is our, our show model that we take over here. Um, so again, this uh, black grit motor is used as a single stage, as a second stage, and as a third stage. And we even have another motor that we fly. It's basically half a black grit that we use as a four stage. Uh, so we can use this in a number of different vehicle configurations. Back here, if you get a chance to take a look at it, is our uh, vehicle stable picture. And just to give you a scale, um, the one that you see standing up here behind me is uh, this vehicle here. Um, any, of these, any of these black ones here, that's this motor. As you can see, it's used all the way from a single stage and a two stage and a three stage and a four stage configuration. And here's that little half of a black ring I was telling you about. That's it what we call an exo-atmospheric motor, which means it burns outside of the atmosphere, so it doesn't have any fins. Are these mostly solid fuel? Or are these they are exclusively solid fuel. Uh, we don't fly any liquid or hydrogen. Um, when it comes to solid fuel, I always get deodorant and salt propellant confused. One's aluminum perchlorate, one's ammonium perchlorate. Ammonium perchlorate. Is the solid. Is the oxidizer in the fuel, and then it also has powdered aluminum in it. To oh, give that it makes it get really good. white, too. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Everything is solid rocket motor. We, we fly fins on all of our rockets, which means um, we actually pant the fins a little bit, and that allows us to spin. spin and we are spin stabilized, right? It's a lot cheaper than a thrust vector or guidance system. Uh, yep, and it's just kind of the, the principle of a bullet spinning when it comes out of a gun. You have a lot more stability when you're spinning. Do the different stages fit inside and stack like that? Or does it matter? Uh, the stages just stack right on top of each other. So first stage, second stage, third stage. So they're a little bit smaller, each um, stage is pulled up. we actually have one where we have a, a narrower diameter base, and then it actually goes out. Okay. It looks a little funny on the rail, but it works just the same. Okay. Every stage is recoverable? No, only the payload. Only the payload? Yep, so all the rocket motors get expended every time we fly. Do they go into the Atlantic? Or the Atlantic or the desert. Um, okay. Or when we fly in Alaska, sometimes we'll actually recover the motors so they don't pose an environmental hazard. But what about the fuselage? Like the shell? Yep. Okay. They make great fish <laughs> <laughs> for the fish No, no, they're great. Yep. <laughs> Black Brit vehicle. And then the 287 means it's a 287.
seven uh, of this type of vehicle to fly. The name Samara is the name of the principal investigator. It's Dr. Samara. Uh, I forget which university she's from. Uh, but each one gets a number and a name assigned to it. Uh, so right here, you can see this is the housing or structure for the payload electronics. Right behind the skin section is the actual telemetry module uh, that's going to be flown out of Alaska this winter. Uh, you can see all sorts of components here. The white box is where the batteries, the relays, transmitters, antennas are on the skin section here. Um, and then we've got the encoder stack, which collects all the data on board the rocket and packages it so it can be transmitted down to the ground. The next module over is the attitude control system. You can see the, the kind of diamond shaped gray module there, those are the jets that will fire the uh, nitrogen gas. Uh, this is our ground station equipment here. When we're over in the testing lab testing, we can have everything on, radiating data, and then they can be monitoring the data right here to make sure everything's surviving on the testing. And again, we have three of these labs.